Thank you. Earlier we heard from Senator Klobuchar, now we'll hear from another leader, leader in the Senate from the other side of the aisle. Our next guest took office in 2015 after one term in the House and a distinguished service in the U.S. Army. He has since garnered a reputation in the Senate as an active voice on foreign policy issues and as an outspoken critic of Iran's aggression throughout the Middle East. He joins us today to discuss the critical issues facing America and Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. Thank you Cotton. very Thank much you. for that very warm welcome. Thank you for the kind introduction. I feel like I should have an Oscar ready to present. Exactly. Just a few people here, right? <laughs> As a member of Congress, you've been a consistent and vocal supporter of the U.S.-Israel relationship. And I want to ask you what, what I asked Senator Klobuchar. Why is this issue important to you? Where does your passion for Israel and this relationship come from? Well, well personally, where it comes from for me is everything I know about the modern nation of Israel and its connection to the United States. It goes back so deeply in our history. You know, the, the pilgrims called America a new Zion. Um, and America has always been welcoming and open to the Jewish people um, in a way that you could come to America and, and be fully American and, and also fully Jewish, which isn't always the case in nations around the world. Um, also, my personal travels to Israel, which I've now done several occasions since I was first elected to the Congress. Um, more deeply, though, where it comes, not just for me, but for the United States uh, as a whole, is from our people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, administrations, presidents, secretaries of state and defense come and go. Um, some are more supportive of that alliance than others. Um, but Congress is the source in, in Washington uh, of the continued bedrock relationship between the United States and Israel. But. Don't clap too much for Congress. <laughs> but but the, the reason for that is because the people who send us here are, are the true foundation of that relationship. And it's the relationship between the American people and the Israeli people that make it a unique relationship with any nation that we have in the world. Um, and that, that's why you continue to see overwhelming majorities of both the House and the Senate supporting the U.S.-Israel relationship. Thank you. You served our country in the U.S. Army for nearly five years on active duty, including two combat tours. So we want to thank you for that. Thank you for your service. You. How did that experience help shape your view of America's role in the world? And, and how did that experience give you some sense of understanding about what Israel might be facing in terms of that, the yeah. threat to its borders? You know, some people, some people will ask me, it's like, well, did your time in the Army shape your worldview? And it's like, it's close, but it's kind of exactly opposite. I joined the Army in large part because of my worldview. <laughs> now, it was reinforced at a couple different ways. First, at a general level about America's role in the world and the kind of world we face. And second, about the very specific nature of the threats that, US, that the U.S. and Israel face. So first, at a general level, uh, we live in a dangerous, chaotic world. It always has been that. It always will be that. Um, it, it's great to have strong diplomacy, to have international accords, uh, to have treaty allies, but at bottom, <laughs> foreign policy geopolitics starts at the end of an M4 rifle, and unfortunately, it sometimes has to end there as well. Um, and no matter what else you have, if you don't have a, a military that is capable of defending your people and protecting its interests and its allies around the world, then you are not prepared to cope with that world. Um, one day, one, one day the lion may lay down with the lamb, but until that day, and actually on that day, I would rather be the lion than the lamb. Um, but the second, more specific point that you asked about, Claire, is the nature of the threats we face. So when I was in Baghdad in 2006, uh, we patrolled a couple different neighborhoods. Uh, one was almost exclusively Shiite, the other one was mixed, so it, it had more ethnic violence. Um, but, but we face threats from both sides in those two neighborhoods that really reflect the continued threats in the Middle East that the United States and Israel face today. So on the one hand, 
in the predominantly Shiite neighborhoods, you had Shiite militias that were supported and oftentimes infiltrated by Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And they would even supply a kind of very deadly roadside bomb known, known as the explosively formed projectile that could penetrate any US vehicle's armor to include an Abrams tank. Um, on the other side, you, you had a lot of foreign fighters at the time, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it later morphed into the Islamic State. Um, that was being supported by Sunni extremist groups, you know, going back to their roots in the Brotherhood from the very beginning. Um, and those two threats are still there today. You still have the threat of Sunni extre extremism in the form of Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. You still have uh, a radical Shiite axis that is led by, and in most places, controlled by Iran. Uh, those threats exist to, to Israel today. They still exist to us as well. That's why it's so important that we have our partnership not just with our two nations, but also with similarly situated nations in the Middle East that also face those two threats. Well, and speaking of Iran, you, you were vehemently opposed to the nuclear deal with Iran. You've you, you could say that. Just <laughs> continue to be outspoken uh, in your views on that topic. Now, President Trump has laid out what he sees as the flaws in the deal and how it should be fixed. Do you think the deal can be fixed, and what do you think the U.S. position is? Well, I don't think that we can sit down with uh, the Ayatollahs and try to renegotiate a new deal. We're not, that's not going to be successful. It'll take 18 months to even agree on which five-story resort they want to meet at in Switzerland. Um, and it'll take 18 months just to set out the schedule of meetings. What we can do as United States, and in concert with Europe, is say, these are the flaws with the deal the last administration negotiated, and this is what we're going to do if Iran ever goes beyond, say, the number and the kinds of centrifuges it's spending, spinning, or the missiles that it's testing, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, that doesn't require us to go back to Iran to negotiate a deal. It just says if Iran takes these actions, which unfortunately they're in many cases allowed to do under the nuclear deal, we will take these very severe punitive actions And as make well. that public. Lay oh, yeah, make that public. public. I mean, we can pass legislation in the Congress that would reflect that. We'd want the European... Uh, the three European partners to, to make that same commitment to us as well, to make it a multilateral agreement too. Mm -hmm. Well, and beyond the nuclear question, Iran's regional aggression, as you know, has continued to expand. We see it in Syria, in Yemen, and Iraq. Do you think the U.S. has a strategy to counter Iran in the region? Is it, is it an effective strategy and one that would stop Iran from cementing that position in Syria? on Israel's border? Certainly more so than we did 18 months ago. Uh, we're moving in the right direction in terms of the sanctions actions that the administration has taken against specified Iranian persons and organizations, um, against the, you know, the, the personnel that we now have present in Syria, some of the diplomatic um, relationships we've built, not just, again, with Israel, but with like-minded nations in the GCC, like the United Arab Emirates. Um, we still have some work to do there, but the most fundamental point is that this administration sees Iran for what it is, for an, an aggressive, theocratic regime that is exporting violence and instability around the region. Not, not a partner, not someone that we can turn the neighborhood over with and hope that there's a balance between Iran and its allies and Saudi Arabia and its allies. Uh, so there's still some more practical steps to take, um, but we've come a long way in the last 18 months. And finally, um, and, and to step back for a minute, you also sit on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I know that the U.S. intelligence community just recently presented their annual worldwide threat assessment to the committee. What do you see that you can talk about with us as the gravest security threats facing the United States today? Well, terrorism remains a serious threat at all times to our nation, to Israel, to European nations. Uh, but ter terrorists typically need the support of a nation state in one way or another to bring to bear true destruction. So, so I, I would tend to look at nation state threats that we face. There's two great powers through their nuclear capabilities have just the capability to destroy our way of life. That's Russia and China. Um, Russia is a declining power. Its economy is smaller than Italy's economy, smaller than the five Scandinavian and Nordic countries. Uh, but it still has a leader who's very aggressive. He's willing to take risks as we saw in our elections in 2016, as we saw in his speech last week boasting about new kinds of nuclear weapons, uh, as we've seen in Ukraine, uh, Crimea, uh, and actions throughout Europe. China, on the other hand, is a rising power. Its economy still tends, is still growing at a very rapid clip. It's plowing 
billions and billions of dollars every year into research into, say, artificial intelligence and machine learning and quantum computing, the kind of breakthroughs, not just in industry but on the battlefield, that could allow them to have a huge leap ahead in terms of military technology. Um, but not, besides those two great powers, we have two rogue regimes as well, Iran and North Korea. Um, some people may say North Korea is a small problem in, in East Asia, you know, for South Korea and Japan and the United States. That's not the case. Just last week, uh, it was publicly disclosed that they have uh, exported a lot of chemical-related uh, um, technology to Syria, which obviously creates a real problem for Israel and the Middle East. Um, and then there's Iran. I mean, as serious of a problem as North Korea is today with nuclear weapons, Iran is an even graver problem for the United States and Israel and our, 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 our allies in the Middle East. Why is that? I mean, look at the geopolitical circumstances. North Korea is a very small, isolated, poor country that's on the edge of the world. It's surrounded by four nations that are vastly more powerful than it. Um, it doesn't have an, an aggressive ideology that it tries to export. Um, Iran, by contrast, is a very large nation. It's surrounded by 10 to 20 peer competitors, depending on how those peers define themselves. It's at the crossroads of civilizations. It does have a very aggressive ideology that it tries to export. That makes the possibility of a nuclear Iran sometime in the future vastly more dangerous than the reality we face right now with North Korea. We will have to end on that sober note, but I thank you very much, Senator Cotton. Let's give him a round of applause for his time and coming today thank to you. speak to us. Senator, thank you.